R. I'm Dr. Natra Isan. I'm from the Faculty of Agriculture, University Putra, Malaysia, and I'm the moderator of today's webinar session. Uh, on behalf of WAS APC Board, I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar series, this time on microbial management in aquaculture, co-organized with UC Putra Malaysia and Aquaculture Innovation Center Singapore. So before we begin, let me remind all of you on the housekeeping. First, please ensure that your mic is muted and your video is turned off. Second, should you have any questions to the panelists, please use the chat box at the bottom right of this WebEx platform and send it to all panelists. And I'll address the questions to the relevant panelists later. Uh, and today, all right, so let's begin. Today, we are very fortunate to have five speakers from different universities, industries, and also government agency to share their insights and experiences with us on microbial management, both for fish and shrimp in hatcheries and outdoor system. We will first start the session with talks from the speakers and we will leave the panelist discussion at the end of the session, right? And without further delay, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Patrick Sargalus. Dr. Patrick is currently an Emeritus Professor of Aquaculture in Gen University, Belgium. Patrick obtained his PhD in Marine Biology in 1975 from Gen University, and in 1978, he set up the Artemia Reference Center. He was also the co-founder of the spin-off company on Artemia system that is now operating under the name of Inve Aquaculture, which belongs to Benchmark Holding. Patrick, as we all know, has been super active in aquaculture. He has been involved in World Aquaculture Society, the European Commission and the European Aquaculture Technology Innovation Platform, and has received honorary awards from various countries, including China, Egypt, Greece, India, Malaysia, Russia, Thailand, USA, and also Vietnam. So welcome, Patrick, to the webinar. And uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Natra, and uh, I think a uh, great initiative to uh, uh, organize this webinar on uh, microbial management. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me a chance to uh, give the uh, uh, opening presentation. Uh, several of uh, the um, participants, particularly from uh, uh, Asia Pacific countries, will remember that I have touched upon uh, this subject at a number of earlier occasions. I'm very pleased that this time we will be able to listen more to the uh, field sector so that uh, maybe I can repeat a little bit on the, the, let's say, the scientific evidence and the need that was expressed already uh, more than 10 years ago at FAO that we should focus more on disease prevention. Disease treatment is, of course, important, but we should focus more on disease prevention. And it became also obvious uh, with the new tools that became available that one of the priorities for the past decade was to focus on uh, microbial management. And not the least because of all the problems uh, that were showing up in the last decade, uh, not the least uh, uh, with shrimp uh, in uh, particularly Asian countries. And you see that already in 2013, 2014, uh, some of us uh, at Ghent University were uh, coming up with the hypothesis that maybe some of the problems uh, might have been caused by um, improper microbial management. The same observation uh, when you look at that big industry, the European sea bass and sea bream industry, a picture that is only uh, a couple of years old, so the situation is still very similar to what you see here, maybe an average uh, survival uh, in the Baz and the Bream hatcheries that has increased maybe now uh, up to the 30, 35 percent area, but you see big, big fluctuations, big standard deviations. And um, most people are aware that it has to do with microbial community composition, but not being sure how to tackle it or what might be uh, the real cause. 
big change came when the new tools became available um, and that uh, suddenly it uh, became clear that um, we have a huge diversity of uh, bacteria in our aquatic environments, which we can simplify uh, 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 and split into uh, the uh, neutral beneficial bacteria. Uh, honestly speaking, we had underestimated the beneficial role of a lot of these bacteria, but we're focusing most of the time on the pathogens, particularly the obligate pathogens, but we underestimated the uh, role of the potentially harmful bacteria, the so-called opportunists, uh, uh, to which uh, the uh, Vibrio uh, species group uh, belongs. So in aquaculture, of course, we do not want to uh, uh, have any presence of pathogens and uh, do disinfection, not realizing that just upon the uh, uh, disinfection, you get a new colonization. And this is where, without going into too much details here, the big difference between the so-called R strategists and the K strategists is something that uh, the group uh, from Norway, uh, you will hear about in a moment, has focused a lot, been able to characterize uh, these different groups and where we see that uh, the conditions in aquaculture, particularly upon uh, these infection and when we are stocking the ponds, favor these R strategists. And these are the ones that under certain conditions can be uh, uh, can express uh, virulence. And what are these uh, uh, special uh, conditions? Well, for example, quorum sensing. Quorum sensing where uh, these sophisticated bacteria communicate, interact, and when quorum, when a certain number uh, is reached, only then they switch on virulence genes and reach a pathogenic uh, status. One important characteristic, but this is where you see how science is developing. A number of old and new papers have learned about a new phenomenon, the so-called phenotype switching, where under influence, and I still put it under parenthesis because all kinds of conditions, uh, 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 particular uh, uh, products or situations, uh, can uh, uh, also induce the Vibrio to switch on virulence, switch off virulence, a phenomenon which we call phenotype switching. And we are just recently, uh, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, several uh, new papers have been uh, uh, published. So this is the uh, uh, simplified animation on what is happening in our uh, uh, aquaculture systems upon these infection. Okay, we have um, we have um, eliminated the bacteria, but we get a quick recolonization, and this is where under the conditions where we bring in the animals, we provide food, be it in the pond, be it in the hatchery tank, we see that our R strategists get a chance to develop, get the chance to develop, and provide it time is uh, uh, given, we see that we, we will get a better uh, distribution, a better harmony with the domination of the uh, uh, K strategists. And this is the situation where, in fact, we can assure the best conditions. Problem is that very, very often, and that's where uh, we could uh, learn from Past empirical observation, some of you will remember the times bioluminescence, uh, uh, Zoia 2 syndrome, Bolitas, uh, different fibriosis situations, which were caused by conditions where eventually the uh, uh, peak of the R strategists reached uh, critical numbers. Many times people are asking, what is that critical number? Well, this is in fact where we still need more uh, research to better understand what is happening. Changing the water, a very regular uh, uh, 30, 40 percent change of the water on a daily basis is apparently with stira, with disinfected water is not a good idea because then you are indeed washing out the bacteria, but you will give again uh, a better chance to the R strategists than uh, to the K strategists. Um, recirculation technology uh, uh, is the one 
where we know from past experience that uh, this is uh, giving good results. With the knowledge we have now, uh, this is a system where the K strategists can dominate over the R strategists. And uh, probably uh, uh, we will hear a bit more about from Kari, but I'll draw your attention to several good papers uh, that have been uh, published uh, recently in the last couple of years on these phenomena. So a lot of the empirical observations of the past, which now we can uh, link to mi microbial matured water, uh, explain how uh, we can favor uh, these K strategists. The green water systems, the tilapia co-culture, we will hear a number of examples uh, in the uh, uh, field presentations that are following. I'm just <clears throat> taking one where we have a nice illustration of that new phenomenon of uh, phenotype switching, bioflock systems, although we still know that uh, uh, in, in many situations this can be a favorable condition, but at times uh, 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 providing substrate for the bacteria if you don't have the right uh, composition this uh, could be a risky event, but it has been demonstrated a number of papers that uh, uh, animals produced in a bioflock system uh, respond better in a challenge test. So apparently, uh, or uh, uh, better prepared to uh, uh, an exposure uh, to the Vibrio parahemolyticus. But in that paper, uh, uh, more research was suggested to try to understand the mechanisms. More recently, uh, published uh, just only uh, a number of months ago, where the new technique where you could look into gene expression uh, was applied. Now uh, we, can ex we can explain and see that the bioflock system, in fact, results in phenotype switching. So with this time, and uh, it was first through the European Commission, but now also the FAO, that the so-called GAPs, which are considered like uh, the Bible, that uh, we need to adjust these, that we need to look into new recommendations and that uh, uh, biosecurity, of course, is a crucial one, needs to be maximized, but that here we need to pay more attention to microbial conditions. And this is where uh, you will hear in the next presentations on what kind of approaches uh, are being taken up. I also draw your attention that uh, live food is very critical in many situations we have seen, be it algae or rotifers or artemia, that uh, one has to pay attention also to uh, the uh, microbial conditions because live food can easily be contaminated with the critical vibrios. So we talk about uh, specific pathogen-free conditions throughout the production cycle. This is also taken up by uh, uh, FAO. FAO that uh, is giving more attention to uh, these uh, microbial management protocols, but indeed also agrees and concludes that we still need more knowledge. Uh, we have very good indications. I, I'm happy that we will uh, hear several uh, field presentations in the next presentations, but uh, this is not the end. We still need to learn further about uh, the specific behavior of these bacteria and how we can develop systems to uh, uh, control uh, this uh, KR strategy uh, uh, concept. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So let, let me remind all of you again that uh, Q&A would be at the end of the session. And if you have any questions, please use the chat box to uh, address your questions, okay? All right, so we shall now move to our second speaker, Dr. Kari Achramado from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Dr. Kari has worked with marine RAS and microbial control for 20 years. She has her PhD from the NUST, where she is also currently employed as associate professor and also uh, supervising and teaching master students and personnel in the industry about microbial control and RAS system. Her main job is as head of the R&D for the RAS supplier of Novitec. Uh, so without further ado, uh, please, Dr. Kari. You Thank you. Your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. 
Uh, this presentation that I'm going to give is made by Professor Ola Wadstein and myself, and I'm really excited about sharing the research from our group about the application of microbial management in commercial hatcheries. So uh, the research in our group on this topic extends 30 years back, and as you can see from this list, it has been the focus of, of uh, several PhD theses over the years and resulted in many published papers. So today I will try in a very short time to give a summary of the most exciting things we have learned along the way. And living in water is uh, really to breathe, drink, eat, and going to the toilet in the same water as all your friends and being in constant close contact with a high number of bacteria. And it can also be easy to forget that when we as fish farmer feed the fish, we also feed the bacteria in the system. And uh, except from a few well-described pathogens, we have limited knowledge about who are the good and who are the bad. And we don't know what is needed for a healthy microbiota, and it's likely mainly related to activities and not to species. So what we do know is that good bacteria give normal development and protect against disease. Uh, we know that specific pathogens need needs to be kept out of the system. And we also know that a lot of the problems in aquaculture are not related to specific pathogens, but are caused by naturally occurring uh, opportunistic bacteria that can uh, become pathogenic when the host is weakened by environmental stress. We know, of course, that the biofilter function is very important for the conversion of toxic ammonia in recirculating systems. We know also that biofilm anywhere in the system will act as a source of bacteria to the water. And we also know now that a lot of different states can be normal uh, and uh, the bacteria profile can be very different between systems that can still be operating in a good way. Uh, we all agree that strong hygienic barriers should be used to protect the system from specific pathogens. Um, but even with optimal biosecurity, bacteria will grow inside the system. Uh, in a marine hatchery tank, sorry, I'm just going to give a better pointer like this. Um, in a marine hatchery fish tank, uh, around 35 to 95 of the bacteria are actually born in that tank, depending on tank water exchange rate and type of rearing system. So this graph that you see here, um, is the number of living bacteria measured through the water system in a commercial flow through hatchery for halibut. And as you can see, it's very unlikely for a bacteria to go from the intake water and all the way uh, through the water treatment of a sand, by a sand filter, a UV, a protein skimmer, and another UV, and to reach the fish tank alive. But still, as you can see, there is a lot of bacteria in the fish tank. So there is a regrowth inside of the system, even if biosecurity is high. Uh, the fact that we don't know who is friend or foe calls for an alternative strategy. We have successfully used the RK concept of ecology, uh, ecolo ecological theory, stating that generally one out of two uh, strategies will be favored in the competition for resources. The carrying capacity is the maximum number of bacteria that can be sustained in the system over time, and it depends on the limiting resource, which in our case is the supply of uh, organic matter. Uh, as we heard before, our selection happens in unpredictable, unstable environments with a lot of empty niches where the food supply per bacteria is high and therefore it pays off to be able to grow and reproduce fast. On the other hand, case selection happens in stable, predictable, crowded environments where the carrying capacity is close to the uh, or the uh, supply uh, uh, of food per bacteria is close to the carrying capacity and where the favored ability is competing for a limited resource. Um, so, um, 
uh, unfortunately, there are a couple of processes in intensive aquaculture that actually promote our selection. First, uh, when we feed the fish, it increases the organic matter available to the bacteria in the water and it reduces competition for that uh, food. It will favor a subsequent bloom of our strategist. Uh, and, and that's uh, like uh, Patrick showed, not what we want in happening in the fish tank. Uh, so, um, uh, secondly, so yeah, so we have to avoid this difference between the carrying capacity of the incoming water and the carrying capacity in the fish tank. And secondly, disinfection do not do so much to the carrying capacity, but it kills all the competitors. So again, after an increase in organic matter supply, uh, you will uh, again, you will end up with, um, uh, after this infection, you end up with our selection. So after adding uh, organic matter, you will end up with more bacteria and a changed composition. And after this infection, you will actually end up with the same amount of bacteria as before uh, and also a changed composition. So it's different from what you might think will happen that you want to kill, kill everything and keep them low. So this is also what we see. If we go back to the commercial hatch, halibut hatchery, you see that it's very clearly from this graph where we measured the um, amount of fast growing bacteria of the population. So it's a, a sign of the opportunists. And you see that in the intake water, it's around 25% of the bacteria uh, are our strategists in comparison to around 85% of the bacteria in the tank after passing several disinfection steps and increasing in organic uh, matter supply. So how can we create K selection? Well, we can create it by creating high competition for the limiting resource by having a high amount of bacteria that is competing for a low supply of organic matter. Um, also, as you saw before, to avoid our selection in the fish tank happening because of an increase in organic loading, case selection should be carried out at a carrying capacity that is similar to that in the rearing tank. And here is the recipe. Uh, there are two relatively easy and practical ways to create case selection. A simple biofilter on the intake water, uh, which can basically be a tank with biofilm carriers and aeration, will secure competition for the available food and unfavorable conditions for opportunist proliferation in a so-called microbial, microbially matured system. In recirculation systems, we already have a biofilter which provide the benefits that I've described before, uh, but in addition, these biofilters are operating at a carrying capacity that is similar to that of the fish tanks. And per definition, re recirculating aquaculture system have a high retention time of water in the system. So in several experiments, we have documented the effects of case selection on the microbial community of the rearing water. And as you can see from this example, the different systems result in significantly different microbial community compositions in the rearing water. We also typically see that the microbial community composition is more stable, diverse, and even in the K-selected systems. In an experiment with Atlantic cod larvae, we compared the stability of the microbial com uh, comp um, composition over time in the water going into and in the rearing tanks um, uh, of a flow through system, a microbially matured system, and a RAS by comparing the ba uh, bacteria profiles from one sample day to the next. And if two samples are the same, have the same microbial prof profile, the value on the i axis will be one. And if the, uh, they have nothing in common, uh, it will be zero. So for the incoming water, as expected, uh, the two K-selected systems have significantly more stable microbiota over time than the flow-through system. And as predicted, it was only the raw system that had a significantly more stable microbiota because here the K-selection happened at a carrying capacity similar to that in the tank. The effect on the larvae was substantial, as you can see on the right, 
with much higher survival in the K-selected systems. Uh, microbial maturation systems have also shown to give a better growth or faster larval growth for turbot larva in three independent experiments that is shown here when compared to conventional flow through systems, as you can see in this graph for day five and day 12 to 15 of the uh, cultivation. In several independent experiments, the use of RAS has markedly increased the survival of cod and lobster larvae compared to flow through systems. And we are not talking about here marginal differences. As you can see, it's substantial increase in the uh, amount of surviving, surviving fish. So these so results have convinced some of the commercial hatcheries to try the same. So these are the results from a commercial halibut hatchery that we instructed actually over the phone. I didn't go there. I just called them and how to construct and operate a very simple RAS for case selection of the rearing water. Actually, it was just adding a biofilter to each tank that treated the same amount of water that uh, would have been exchanged in a flow through tank. New water was exchanged from the system by add addition of intake water to the biofilter and an overflow of the outlet. For the first run, the fish farmers were skeptical. You know, the halibut farmers are conservative, so they put two tanks on RAS and the rest they kept on a conventional flow through system. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, this, this uh, RAS tanks produced 14 times more fish than the conventional system in this run. So then they were a little bit more positive and the next run they made five tanks on RAS and two on conventional flow through. And in this case, uh, the RAS tanks produced in average 4.5 times more fish. And of course, after that, the fish farmer were convinced and they used RAS after. The hydraulic retention time of both the fish tanks and the total system is of importance for the case selection and also for the effect of disinfection in the RAS loop. In fish tanks, bacteria in the water growing slower than the hydraulic retention time will be washed out. In flow through system, that means that they are washed out of the system. In RAS, uh, slower growing bacteria specialists can return to the tank through the water treatment loop, unless of course they are disinfected on the way. In RAS, rel with relatively long hydraulic retention times in the fish tanks, about more than 30 minutes, I think, like you are, will see in most hatcheries, the bloom of opportunistic bacteria will be allowed to happen before the water is disinfected again. So in an experiment with comparing RAS without disinfection to a RAS with disinfection and a flow through system for cod larvae, it was clear that the disinfection can reduce the good case selective effect of the RAS and make both the microbiota and the survival of the fish look more like a flow through system, as you can see here. Uh, also, here we compared the microbiota and fish performance in tanks with different levels of water treatment right on the tank uh, side uh, in a, the same industrial scale RAS and a reference flow through system for lumpfish. In the RAS, the different treatments were from uh, uh, the left to the right in the graph, no, no treatment, microfiltration, uh, microfiltration and UV, and finally, microfiltration and UV and ozone, so very strong disinfection. We found again very clear results that survival was higher in RAS compared to the flow through system and that this disinfection in the RAS loop affected the gill health of the fish negatively. As you see in this graph for the gill scores, where a lower score re represents better gill health, so again, this shows that disinfection in the RAS loop can reduce the good effect of the RAS and make the fish performance look more like that in the flow through system. In marine hatcheries, in addition to the rearing water, the live feed is a very important source of bacteria coming in con close contact with the fish. Several studies have shown that live feed often carry a lot of R-selected opportunistic bacteria to the fish. Here I show you that it can be relatively easy to influence the live feed with a more case-selected microbiota. 
these are unpublished studies and uh, showing that an opportunity with uh, showing an opportunity to influence the package of bacteria fed to the larvae. To the left, we cultured copper pods in normal flow through tanks and in tanks with a biofilter in front, providing microbially matured water and in a RAS for copper pods. You see the dotted lines here, they represent the copper pods, the, micro, the microbiota of the copper pods. Um, the fill lines represent the microbiota of the culture water. And the blue dot here is the microbiota of the algae, algae that was fed to the copper pods. And as you can see, the copper pods to a high degree mirrors the microbial com uh, composition of the water in which they were cultured. And the copper pods from the RAS contain a much lower fraction of opportunistic bacteria than the copper pods uh, from the other systems. Uh, to the right here, uh, we cultured Artemia in tanks with disinfected water, uh, um, in tanks with microbial immatured water, and at, uh, in tanks filled with ras uh, water from a RAS. The upper graph here is the water, the culture water, um, uh, with the microbiota here, and uh, the lower graph is for the uh, microbiota of the Artemia. And as you can see, the Artemia again mirrors the microbial composition of the water in which they were cultured, and the Artemia from the RAS water contain much lower fraction of opportunistic bacteria than the Artemia cultured in the other systems. In these systems, we didn't uh, see that the microbially matured water did uh, improve the live feed microbiota compared to the co conventional production. And we have not yet looked into feeding fish with these differently treated live feeds, but we expect to see a difference in the performance of fish. So the take home message from this presentation is that uh, opportunistic R strategists create problems, but can be selected against with case selection. It is possible and relatively simple to set up case selection of bacteria in the rearing water. And case selection of rearing water improves survival, growth rate, and general viability of marine larvae. Although biosecurity into the system is very important, disinfection creates R selection and subsequent regrowth of bacteria. And the microbial com composition of the live feed can be influenced by case selection of the culture water. So the effects I have shown you uh, have been extensively documented in many experiment experiments over 30 years and with different species, both in the lab and in commercial hatcheries. So we are confident that these are re robust and consistent conclusions. So if you have any further questions or want to discuss or, or uh, cooperate, please contact us um, and we will, uh, we will uh, talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kari. Okay, let's move to the third presenter, which is from the industry, Mr. Robbins McIntosh. Mr. Robin is, okay, let me introduce him. Mr. Robin is an executive vice president of the Charon Pork Pan Foods Public Company Limited. It is the largest integrated producer of aquaculture shrimp in the world. And uh, Mr. Robin's responsibility is currently in terms of management of the shrimp development program. Mr. Robin joined uh, CP in 2001 and was tasked with the job of reviving the company's stream aquaculture division. And as part of this process, he oversighted the interaction of Pinus Wanami into Thailand, the development of SPF Pinus Monodon, and the, modern, the modernization of hatcheries and farm. His work at CP has increased, increased stream production at the company for from 5,000 tonnes to over 90,000 tons annually in 2010s. So let's hear from Mr. Robbins. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am talking to you today from just having returned from the homegrown farm in Florida to Thailand. So I'm in a seven day quarantine hotel and hopefully this works out okay. Uh, Dr. Sorgos asked me to present something, so that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be something. And I titled this, The Application of Water Recycle Recirculation in an Inland Shrimp Hatchery to Obtain Microbial, and I should have put Environmental uh, Stability for Superior Results. 
And I guess this is a culmination of a long process that I've been through in my life. And so if I want to go back and kind of go to the beginning in the 1980s, we ran hatcheries and we didn't really have disinfection. We used filtration for the most part and we did okay. And the first hatchery in 1988, 89, where we thought we were advancing the technology by introducing disinfection, all of a sudden the hatchery had many, many problems. Sometimes we'd have successful tanks, but oftentimes our tanks would fail. And I started thinking without really understanding anything, why does this tank good and that tank bad? Why, what is the difference? And my conclusion and to myself was it had to have been microbial. Everything else was a constant. And so if I could see good microbes in tanks routinely, I could probably increase the probability of a successful tank. Um, so that was one experience. Uh, another experience with disinfection would have come along uh, with EMS. So the first time I saw EMS was back in, in uh, what was it, 2009 uh, in Fuji in China. Uh, and then I watched it move. And I noticed over time, over two or three years, there was a pattern. It always seemed to correspond with disinfecting ponds. And the more we disinfected, the more we got EMS. And I actually took those observations into my little uh, trial laboratories and my genetic uh, challenge centers and actually determined that if I had a more complex ecosystem, I would have less chance of the Vibrio perihemolyticus bacteria taking over and I had fewer problems. But if I simplified the ecosystem by disinfecting, I would have the worst problems. So that's another observation. Then we talk about recycling, and we've, al we've always known, even from the 1990s, where I put recycling in our maturation, that if I recycle water in maturation, I get a better result than if I have flow through. And again, that is because of stability, stabilizing microbial populations, stabilizing environmental populations. So stability was very, very important to this whole process. So I'm going to talk mostly about homegrown and how we've gotten to where we are today. Homegrown shrimp is in Florida. It was basically established on a as a conceptual farm. Culture shrimp anywhere. Culture shrimp any time of year. Completely biosecure farm and no discharge of wastewater. So on this on this particular slide, uh, I'm showing the the artist's rendition. This is what we have built now. This is the hatchery complex, administration warehouse complex. We're building this part right now. That's the farming complex. It's anywhere, anytime because it's a covered farm so that we can maintain optimum conditions being 30 degrees with totally recycled, recirculated water. Uh, this is an inland farm by regulation. I cannot discharge uh, since it is 40 miles from the ocean. I have to make up all of the seawater uh, from using groundwater and adding salts. And then of course, that's an expensive process if you discharge it, but we have to reuse it. So we have to recycle and uh, that's what we are doing. So I jotted down a few idea or reasons why I recycle or recirculate. One, it's an inland shrimp hatchery and farm. They use a seawater made of mixing artificial salt with potable fresh water. It's too expensive to do anything but recycle or recirculate. Uh, homegrown shrimp are free of all pathogens. So SPF is a critical component to anything and everything I do. Uh, and what makes homegrown being an inland farm with no farms around it, this farm has actually been very easy to operate. It's much like my, uh, my uh, SPF broodstock nucleus breeding facilities. Culture there is easy we get 95% survival in our nucleus breeding facilities. Uh, we don't use seawater. We use artificial water that we recycle and, and re renovate every time we have a new cycle. I've used the same water in nucleus breeding for 15 years. So we have recycled it many, many times. And then recirculated water is microbi microbiologically more stable and results are superior. In maturation, we know we get higher fecundity when we recycle or recirculate and higher survival uh, through the whole hatchery process. Now, in homegrown, 
uh, we're going to use a new strain that I developed just for indoor farms, the U.S. and Europe. I call it the Bolt. Uh, it's named after Usain Bolt, a very fast human being. So this is a very fast growing shrimp. I think this is, I know this is the fastest growing shrimp in the world. Uh, we can grow, as shown here, the age of 59 is actually, uh, take 10 days off that. It's a 47 day animal uh, and we're getting close to 30 grams. When you have ideal conditions, ideal conditions means stability. Now to digress a little bit, I wanna talk about a, a process that I developed in Thailand for our hatcheries in Thailand. The problem we've always had is we have to disinfect for specific pathogens. But when we disinfect, we get rid of all of the complex mature bacteria. And because we're changing water all of the time, we basically stay in a state of flux. So I developed the idea several years ago of mature water conditioning. Uh, decay strategy. And out here, I show you here some tanks of mature water. All of this is, is, is a complex of tapioca flour, urea, ammonium, phosphate, sodium silicates, and some bacillus probiotics, where we add the same amount of material every day, and every day we go in and we uh, basically partial harvest the flock out of the tank. And then that is added to the disinfected hatchery water. So we have to disinfect the hatchery, but we don't. We want to make the water more complex. So I add this flock back in. Now, originally the hatchery managers were shocked that you would want to add this dirty contaminated water because it did have bacteria, it had diatoms, it had amphipods. It wasn't quote disinfected water. But the results of doing this, oh, I don't have my result page. I don't know where that went. But anyway, the results were the water that had mature water, it stayed clear. It did not form biofilm in the tank as the normal disinfected water did. And as a result, our survivals would in, increase by 10%. And the size of the shrimp, the PL increased, meaning they were healthier animals. And so after a, a month of this, the hatchery was, was sold on the idea that, yes, we disinfect the water, we get rid of specific pathogens to make sure there's no EHP, make sure there's no EMS bacteria, make sure there's the specific pathogens, and then we dirty the water back up with water that has been matured. Now, to start a mature water tank like this takes three to four weeks. So once we have it started, as I said, we partially harvest it every day, re-add more nutrients, and then just continue the harvest and putting that mature flock in the disinfected water of a hatchery. And it really has stabilized the hatchery from what used to be a, a less stable situation. Now to go to the homegrown shrimp hatchery, here's a, an outline. Uh, we've got larval rearing. This is a small hatchery. This was designed to be operated by two men. Uh, the US and European industries are not big. Uh, salaries are higher. so cannot afford a lot of people if you're gonna have any chance of breaking even or making a little money. So everything was designed for ease of operation, low manpower, and trying to, to, to scope the size so that we stock one room, we see here one larval room, we stock one larval room a week uh, and harvest one larval room a week. And we can stock four rooms uh, in a month. These are the reservoirs of the tank. This is maturation over here. Uh, this is the spawning and hatchery. It's, it's a small hatchery. Uh, and this is all the right recycle area over here. And I'll go over that uh, in, in the uh, future. So recirculation recycle hatchery results. This shows the PL6 out of the hatchery. We can't grow these PLs more than six because they get too big to ship. If I grew this to a PL8, the size is 11 millimeters. These are the fastest growing PLs I've ever grown in my life. And the CV is, is 10 to 12. They're just a very uniform, healthy animal with high survival, 70 to 80%, uh, and the stress test greater than 95. And surprisingly, when we look at the PL themselves, you know, at CP, we have a QC process where we look at one gram of PL and we look at the Vibrio count, the yellow or the TCBS count, the yellow and the green, and we have certain uh, limits that you can do. But at, at homegrown, we have no detectable green TCBS colonies. 
and we have very few yellow TCBS colonies. But what we do have is a lot of these bacteria, which uh, I'll call more the, the K or the uh, mature bacteria. So here's the water system that we that I operate. Now at the hatchery, on the hatchery side, we're trying to go from very dirty water out of the hatchery back to coral reef water in a few days. So this system uh, rotates about every 10 days. It starts off with an anaerobic settling pond. So this is the settling pond. It goes in from the hatchery into a settling. It becomes anaerobic. That denitrifies the system and settles out the solids. It goes to a second stage through a sand filter into a seaweed pond. The seaweed pond that we're using is using Gracilaria at this point, and that's the polisher. It then will go into a chlorine pond where we're chlorinating it and flocking out more of the organics that have gotten in the water uh, into a protein skimmer pond where again, we're skimming, again, getting more of the organics out of the water. And then we go into another oxygenation or holding reservoir. Uh, I call this nano pond because we use a nano generator to put lots of fine oxygen bubbles in the pond uh, as a finishing step. The whole process is about 10 days. And let's go through it step by step. First, I base this on the CP broodstock closed system. So I've run this system uh, in our inland nucleus breeding for, for 12, 15 years. And it's basically the same system that I've used very successfully in the broodstock program. So the first is the, the uh, settling and the anaerobic. This is homegrown. This would have been the CP broodstock. Uh, it removes the solids and the nitrates. Then it will go through that sand filter into the algae pond. Now, this is the brood stock. They're using a cholerapa in, in Thailand. Here, I'm using a gracilaria. But the, the idea is the same, and the results are the same. It scrubs out the phosphates. It scrubs out any trace minerals that may have built up in excess uh, and any uh, remaining nitrogen that may be in the system. And then we'll go into the next stage, which is the chlorination, where we add uh, 30 to 40 ppm chlorine. Again, this flocks out. Uh, it's recycled through rapid sand filters for 24 hours. And by the end of this process, the water is really clear. But then as a final touch, it goes into what we call the protein skimmer pond. These are the protein skimmers. It will then recycle through the protein skimmer pond, removing any excess organic uh, proteins or organic uh, material uh, for one day. And then we pass it into the nano pond. Right now, the nano generators have not been installed. They just arrived. We're using Venturi aeration to do that final polish with the uh, uh, with the uh, in that in that pond. This is the this is essentially the aging pond or the oxygenation pond in, in Thailand on our closed broodstock. The water is very very good at this point. And the final step is it will go through ozone. Again, a disinfection step to make sure we get rid of specific pathogens. Uh, and this is the final, what the final water looks like. It's swimming pool, clean, clear, uh, high quality water that's been produced in that 10 day process. Now within the hatchery, uh, we have two recycles. Uh, one is in maturation, the other is larval rearing. So in maturation, we have the maturation tanks that will go through a coarse filter bag to get rid of large particles, then through a bead filter, then it will go through a protein skimmer, finally through a biofilter, and then back to the reservoir before it goes back to the maturation tanks. The important thing here is we don't have any disinfection after the biofilter. So this is reseeding our water with the good bacteria so that we're not depopulating uh, the tanks at this, uh, in this process here. And this shows the recycle room uh, in the CP nucleus. Again, we have a bead filter, the bag filters down here, bead filter, protein skimmer, uh, a uh, biofilter, and then the reservoir that then goes back into the maturation room. It's the same equipment on just a larger size that I use in the Thailand facility. Again, this shows the, the bead, it goes to a protein skimmer, and then into biofilters. And in the larval unit, we go from larval tanks to a bead filter, to a protein skimmer, and then through a 
biofilter or a trickling filter, and then back to the larval tanks. Uh, we're circulating this about four times a day, uh, and it's worked very, very well uh, in increasing and, and keeping the, the lar larval performance at, at the homegrown facility very, very constant. Uh, the maturation room, uh, I should have noted, we're, we're recycling that also four times a day, uh, or 400 percent. And this shows the larval rearing. So we have a bead filter, the protein skimmer, and then trickling filters. And this is a more close up of the trickling filter, which is kind of nifty because it will both nitrify and denitrify. We were finding that if we do not denitrify, nitri nitrates can uh, build up to 50, 70, 80 parts per million on one cycle through the maturation of larval rearing. Uh, so we have to have a denitrification step. And the best way that we found to do that is an anaerobic surface. And so you have an aerobic surface on the outside of these rocks, inside of these rocks become anaerobic. And so you get a nitrification and denitrification in one nice pass in this particular system. So to conclude, mature water improves the performance of hatcheries by limiting larval pathogens like Vibria. I shouldn't say larval pathogens, I should say the, the, uh, the opportunistic pathogens like Vibria. Artificial seed water made of salts mixed with fresh water can provide superior results to seawater from coastal areas. Now I showed this in Thailand as well. Before I took the salts to uh, the United States, I ran a hatchery on these salts in Thailand and surprisingly, results from artificial salts with fresh water are superior than taking the Gulf of Thailand water and disinfecting it. So uh, everybody is skeptical about that, but the results have been that it's, it's, a, better, it's a better fit than, than trying to disinfect seawater. Recycling of hatchery water is possible, limiting both the discharge of waste and the utilization of new water. Makes it more stable, for sure. And recirculation of shrimp maturation water and of larval water results in a more stable condition, reduced vibrio levels, and improved larval health and performance. And health is everything. You know, we talk about the nutrition, we talk about genetics, but health is not talked about enough. Uh, healthy PLs will outgrow any PL that has genetic improvements and is not healthy. So for me, it's always health first, genetics second. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. So let's uh, move to our fourth presenter today. We have uh, Ms. Pam from uh, the uh, government agencies. She's also the director of Samut Sekon Coastal Ecoculture Research and Development Center, Department of Fisheries Thailand, where uh, they produce uh, a probiotic known as Pormor One, which are being distributed to aquaculture farmers worldwide to improve shrimp and fish culture performances. She has also been working a lot with different aquaculture system and management, particularly on crustacean and fish nutrition for the past 27 years. And additionally, she has experience in civic culture in integrated zero waste farm for more than 10 years. Recently, she developed a culture technique for Kaulapa lentilifera, including other seaweed, and has led, which led to commercial culture ascension of seaweed projects. So, Pam, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Data, and good afternoon, everybody from Thailand. Uh, I'm from Department of Fisheries. Today, I will talk about improved microbial management in outdoor pond shrimp farming in Thailand which I will focus on integrated zero exchange and superior circulation system. I will begin by the shrimp uh, industrial status, then I will go on the principles of zero waste recirculation systems. I will be briefly discuss why these systems are necessary and beneficial for microbial management in shrimp pond. And finally, I will give some examples of the system. Next. The majority of the coastal aquaculture production in Thailand is still shrimp, with 95% uh, is still uh, Pinus Vanamai, and the rest is Pinus Mododon, which account for only 5%. And Thailand has the long coastal line, and uh, 
we have uh, around 18,800 uh, hectares that is uh, intensive uh, farming. And uh, account 85% uh, is a small scale, scale farming. And during 2011 until 2014, there was a drop up of uh, trim production that we caused problems from uh, MS applant from VBO plasmolyticus. At that time, Department of Fisheries tried to uh, cope with the problem, and several measurements is uh, come out. Among that, uh, among these, beneficial bacteria and also the development of a trim farm layout is uh, also one of uh, several key factors. And uh, they are developed like a uh, zero exchange water or reducing water exchange just to prevent uh, the disease uh, or contamination of disease or outbreak. And low water exchange has a of benefit that they can minimize the discharge of pollutants in the, into the environment, environment and also they can uh, pre reduce the transmission of pathogens from outside. However, to reduce the feed remain in the culture pond is also still crucial practice as to reduce loading of organic matter. Some factors that affect to culture success, but one of the key success is the control of organic matter, which is can lead to if it uh, can lead to the bacteria blooming. Organic matter comes from feed, fishes, dead plankton, and organic particles. It can lead to toxic gases, your shortage, bacteria blooming, trim stress, low immunity, susceptible to infection, and low mortality. So, uh, to manage of organic matter, they has a high efficiency of feed management. Remove organic matter by several means, and also input of uh, enough dissolved oxygen and uh, effective microorganisms in the pond. Let me uh, show you about uh, the example of the low water exchange models. In 2014, in order to try to develop the uh, desalination system or low exchange of water, we developed uh, the existing <coughs> seaweed for bioremediation along with other management strategies. And this is the principal three point factory model because we start with at the Petroleum province. In this uh, system, we produce trim in quite uh, normal salinity of seawater, like a 25 ppt. We have uh, four principles of Petroleum model besides good quality of trim larvae, and we have a good pond separation, like uh, use calcium oxide to uh, decrease. Uh, get least disinfect of bacteria together with pond breaking to accelerate decomposition and gas exchange along with back beneficial bacteria. And we also do like a culture management. We use seaweed as the biological water treatment for bioremediation and for biocontrol. And also we use like a feed management. At the early stage, we use the Artemia or live feed in order to reduce the uh, organic matter loading from feed. However, the concern is the live feed need to be the pathogenic free. And also we uh, apply the probiotic and vitamin and minerals to enhance growth and for stability of uh, uh, growth of uh, trim. And all of this is uh, aimed to reduce the impact of organic matter rotting and to prevent harmful bacteria blooming. However, in order to convince the farmer that to reduce the use of antibiotic, so we have the alternative uh, way for them. Like uh, I told you before that uh, in Thailand, most of the farmer is small scale farmers. So we produced the uh, BOMA1 or DOF1 since uh, 2008. It's uh, the mixture of uh, Bacillus species like uh, uh, Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus megatiliums, and Bacillus lichenniformis. It can uh, produce exoxygenate enzymes to degrade, uh, from, uh, to degrade uh, organic matter. And uh, it can change the uh, environment by growing harmless bacteria 
to crowd out pathogens as well as accelerate the composition of corn organic sediment into inorganic nutrients that are dissolved nitrogen. We use this during corn preparation and also for the during the culture for biocontrol of the water quality and also uh, mixed with the feed as uh, used as a probiotic. And this is the, I'd like to show you the petroberry models uh, outlined, which is the small scale of a wide stream uh, culture in the recirculation system. They are comprised of only, only two points. One is the culture point and the other is seaweed. And we have the water supply canal that can uh, exchange water from culture pond into the seaweed pond and then turn back to, to for the culture. The advantage of seaweed is can be the oxygen generator, control of bad microorganisms and control of phytoplankton bloom because it can uptake the, the, the excess of uh, nutrient. And in this uh, system, we used Coropa lentilifera, which is the, now is the uh, commercial uh, culture production in, in Thailand. And the water from trim pond is go to the seaweed port. And this is clear water that we can use back again. And we can also uh, uh, take the harvest the seaweed for, for, for further use. And another sample of zero exchange and recirculation farming system is the Royal Demonstration Sea Farm, which is located on 13 hectares at Pitbury province. And this is uh, as a learning center for farmers that uh, we use the integrated environmental friendly and balanced farming system. Department of Fisheries developed farm management model that different kinds of aquatic species can complement and create benefit to each other. The model comprised of several, you can see that it's comprised of several units of uh, sub farm that uh, has the sea water, estuarine water, and also fresh water. And uh, around this, they have the, the canal or the discharge the canal that the water can uh, go to this canal, can channel and uh, uh, treat by seaweed, the seaweed and then the absorb by seaweed and then the culture water can go further to Artemia to filter the particle, organic matter particle that uh, from uh, feed remain or the light uh, particle. And then the high sanitary water from Artemia can go to produce salt and the sludge we can use as fertilizers. So we also have the mangrove and also the coconut, uh, coconut tree to absorb the, the nutrients. And this is the trim point. We produce shrimp corn here. The shrimp that we produce here is uh, around uh, 10 ppt. And this is the, we produce, we use the Garcilalia, which is the tolerate to lower salinity than Coropa. And then the water uh, that uh, already uh, treated by seaweed, it can go again to uh, culture the, the shrimp. And uh, let me go into some more detail about seaweed. There are several species of seaweed that we can use, like uh, Umba rigida, Holopalentifera, and Gracilalia. And uh, there are several species that uh, it can uh, have the difference totaling to the salinity. So we can select uh, which species that suitable for uh, each, uh, each area. And uh, they can uptake the nutrient from the water that I told you before. And for this, uh, this we show that uh, the removal efficiency for nitrogen of colopa, like uh, one kilogram, is can remove from 3.2 ppm uh, until almost zero ppm within three days. And phosphorus also uh, have the similar trends. And this is also the show you the removal efficiency of seaweed, like a colopa, lapia. Maritima and also Gaxilalia fishlai, that they have different uh, removal efficiencies of uh, nutrient. And this is show you that uh, oxygen that uh, seaweed can uh, produce uh, high oxygen during uh, 
afternoon and blow is at the at the early morning. So during afternoon, we can use the water from seaweed to exchange the water in the trim pond. And as high as 13 milligram per liter can be obtained at dense seaweed. And this is I'll show you the more example of uh, two more example of recirculation trim farming models. Because uh, mostly of the farm, shrimp farming in Thailand, they produce shrimp in a quite low salinity, like a 5 ppt up to uh, 7 ppt. So uh, some species of seaweed, we, like we cannot uh, apply into this kind of uh, the, the, this area. And this is uh, from Mr. Taloon, which he has uh, 20 years experience in shrimp farming. He started with Murderdown farming in 2004. After that, get the disease outbreak. So they later shift to one of my in 2007. However, after two years, they again, he again five, uh, get the handling difficulty of production due to disease. Therefore, he started uh, changing the culture strategies from, uh, from the, the normal, like the exchange water into recirculation and the circulatory system. His principle behind is to manage water and waste. Each farm located in only 20 hectares comprise of 18 culture points, each with 0 0.3 up to 0 0.48 hectares. But he divide into several units. Each unit composed of uh, four culture points and also the uh, waste setting points, like uh, one of the heavy, heavy, heavy sediment and two for the light sediment. In this sediment pond, he used, uh, he cultured several species of fish, like a tilapia, catfish, java barb, and carp, in order to uh, feed on uh, remain food left, shell, uh, shrimp, of shrimp shell, and also to scrabble the sediment. And uh, the water from uh, this uh, sediment uh, pond will go for the water treatment pond, and go for the uh, well prepared uh, water pond and then go back again for the culture. And uh, we also use the former one or bacillus probiotics together with the uh, uh, homemade fermented pineapple. So by, by this uh, his, uh, method, he can produce like uh, 18 up to 31 tons per hectare with high survival rate at uh, more than 90 percent, with uh, 28 up to 44, 40 grams of trim, FCR only 1.2 and 1.3, with the production cost around 120 baht per kilogram. And he never has the problem with the production or culture collapse. Let me show you uh, one more, one more recirculation for recirculation farm. This farm is the Solok farm. It's from uh, running by Mr. Sukhanan Bunshu, who began working on the family farm right out of Katsisad University, uh, officially faculty in 2015. His farm started with since 2007 on the farming area of only 1.6 hectare. His farm model simply applied the circulation system integrated with coconut fuel together with using IoT to control the water quality and control condition. The key factor of farm success is the, he apply the circulation system and he also do nursing of trim during the first 30 days before release into the culture pond. I'll show you this one. And he also had the water treatment pond. So the sediment from the culture pond and sludge will go to the coconut field and then uh, the water will go back again to treat in a uh, treatment pond. And then he used uh, this water for the whole uh, culture period. And he also uh, applied the beneficial bacteria as well. And from his farm area, uh, he earned the production around uh, the same production as uh, the, the former farm. And uh, he can produce four crops annually is with 80 days. And uh, to, wrap up, uh, to wrap up about uh, this, I, I summarized that the recirculations and silo action farming strategies 
offer on the four models. It has like a clean post larvae, pond preparation, water treatment, waste management, and also using beneficial bacteria. And all of these, they use either uh, polyculture or integrated culture to balance the, the ecosystem in the, in the pond. And uh, this, uh, so we come to, to, manage, to manage the microbial in the outdoor pond. We need to do it uh, aquaculture ecological friendly, like uh, have the diversity based aquaculture, eco balance of safety aquaculture, and also zero waste aquacultures. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Okay, now let's move to the last presenter for today. We have Mr. Manuel Pauline, the Head of Technical Services in Inve Agriculture for Shroom Farming. Mr. Manuel has over 25 years of extensive experience in commercial shrimp production, including super intensive shrimp farming, shrimp hatchery and genetic selection program. His responsibilities, among others, include the design establishment and management of the first commercially successful indoor zero water acid biofluid shrimp farm in Europe, particularly in Spain. So, Mr. Manuel, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Uh, hello to everybody. My uh, great pleasure to be here in this very exciting uh, webinar. And the only fact that we have a, a webinar on microbiome management means that uh, this becomes really uh, an important tool for, for, for development in the future. So this is basically my experience working with microbiome and, and, and shrimp farming and how can we see uh, future development and how could we talk about precision farming when we talk about microbiome. So just to start, uh, I'd like to, 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 to focus the, the, the work. What, what I think it's important to try to achieve in the future is to have a more consistent industry when we talk about shrimp farming. And we still have some uh, very inconsistent results from country to country or crops to crops. So really identifying uh, the risk and trying to manage those risks as best as we can to, to have like a sustainable development of this industry, just big challenge to come. So when we look at this configuration, obviously biosecurity becomes a central aspect in all, all agriculture operation. And to, to put it in a very simple manner, talking about biosecurity, we are looking at trying to control the different vectors of contaminations. Uh, the first one being the animals themselves. So there's a big works in process in quality control for hatcheries and also development of genetic lines for sure. And there's also the work that needs to be done on the water resource. Uh, this is critical in terms of intake and discharge, and that's a, that's a very important point. And then you have all the rest I will put in this block. Uh, well, the, the, the people, cross contamination, predators, but also uh, unstable weather, more and more dry and, and typhoon uh, hitting farms across the, across the globe. On the PL side, we all know the importance of having uh, animals free of disease, so SPF certified, that's basically not an option, and also a, a strong quality control on the animals. Uh, as was uh, reminded by, by Robin, if you don't have quality genetics, it doesn't mean much. When it comes to the water, we'll be looking at having a better use of our water, uh, zero water exchange systems being the, 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 the destination. But even trying to reduce those exchanges makes, makes a lot of sense in terms of risk management and sustainability. For the others, well, we will be looking at making smaller ponds uh, and covering them. So ultimately having them indoor, and like, like Robin in, in Florida, or ultimately shading ponds or closing them to have a, a, a better control. This also will be a control for the, for the weather impact. And the weather having a big impact on the on, on the shrimp pond, and this is definitely a risk that we cannot really control. But looking for shrimp systems at the moment, and we looked at lower uh, requirement systems. We have basically two big uh, trends. One will be called bioflux systems. So we are relying on bioremediations. That's directly the topic of today. We are trying to 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 maintain an environment controlled by bacterial communities. On the other side, we have uh, ARS systems. Uh, here, the, the focus remains uh, machinery. Uh, we are talking about mechanical engineering, 
And there is a, a lot of work done in our systems to work with suppression of bacteria, to clean them with sterilization and so on. Unfortunately for shrimp, uh, up to date, the, the figures in terms of pollution cost of our systems uh, remain high, which means for expansion, for the moment, it still remains uh, to be in a, in a niche market. You, you need to have a, a fairly consequent sales price to have viability on, on those projects. So it makes sense at the moment if we want to look at a scalable expansion for future developments. Uh, looking at bio remediation uh, systems uh, also to mention that as long as you are going to be working in, a, in an indoor protected environment you're going to need to manage operation with small ponds which means you're going to need to manage hundreds and hundreds and thousands of ponds so if you want to have something scalable it has to remain simple otherwise you're going to have more and more problems to it so concentrating more on bioflux systems the main uh, approach will be to use the carbon nitrogen ratio uh, to, to feed the environment with carbon to maintain and to develop what we call heterotrophic populations of bacteria that are feeding on this carbon to control the nitrogen and to control uh, our bacterial communities and more specifically when you talk about shrimp farming the, the opportunistic one uh, on, the, on the vibrio. Now when we are looking at the application on this uh, approach uh, personally, across the globe, we can see uh, recurrent problems uh, in many facilities uh, in terms of water quality linked to the accumulation of nitrite. Okay, many operations uh, have this issue of managing nitrite in their systems. What usually happens is when they start their crops, you have a little ammonia spikes coming in that is usually controlled with the addition of carbon, uh, but follow the an accumulation of the nitrites in the system. This accumulation keeps going till it can reach some critical levels, uh, like for example, in this graph, uh, 20 ppm. Uh, farmers is scared, want to control this and start exchanging water. Unfortunately, uh, these systems are usually super intensive, which means that the, the daily nitrogen loads of this system is very high through the feedings. And in my experience, looking at the evolution of the parameters in the crops, even though with many exchanges that can be 50% daily, you still cannot control the spikes of nitrogen. And this usually leads to, to early harvest. And that's, that's a problematic I have seen in a, in a lot of sites. So we have a problem with nitrogen. It seems that it's still there. Uh, so we can get it in a very simple manner. As a farmer that I am, uh, we'll be looking at the nitrogen cycle. And the nitrogen cycle, uh, by a matter of fact, uh, is using uh, autotrophic nutrifiers, as we know. And I'd like to, to, to mention and, and just to say that these autotrophic nutrifiers, uh, it just has been reported that they have a capability of digesting nitrogen that is about 1 million times superior to heterotrophic uh, populations. So and you can see there's a, a massive difference between both. Uh, Another thing to, 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 to look at is autotrophic nitrifiers. By definition, they don't even need the organic carbon source to prosper um, in contradiction to the heterotrophic populations. And reminding that Vibrio is an heterotrophic organism and that will also feed on the carbon that you're adding to the pond. So the, 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 the view of homolysis and addition of carbon is beneficial, but and needs to be handled carefully because it also can, can feed the river and give an advantage to, to those communities. So we you know, have been looked at between the air strategies and the case strategies a few times already in this webinar, but we have this problematic of um, slow growers versus fast growers. And so we all realize the importance of using uh, case strategist in an important concentration. Here we'll be talking about probiotics. So we all know we need to have a, a high concentration of probiotic if we want to have a chance to balance the, the, the air strategies. So at the moment, there's also different kind of uh, techniques employed. Very commonly done, you have fermentation process or brewing process. Okay, that's we are going to be uh, having a, a recipe. So there are many, many recipe. Uh, the farmers will uh, adjust it versus the results and, and work uh, on this over time. I uh, just would like to, to, to re remember that uh, when we are trying to grow bacteria on site in, in, in the tank next to the pond, 
Uh, this is also including some sanitary hazards. We cannot secure that we are only case strategists drawing enough brain tanks. And most of the time, we also can have some pair strategists, which means that we cannot have a very consistent output uh, following this, this, this protocol. So if you want to have consistent outputs, uh, try to have consistent inputs, and that seems to be logical. And there isn't a market today. There's different companies across the world working very heavily on probiotics and can deliver uh, very heavily concentrated products. Uh, I would say that I would basically recommend to use products manufactured in safe conditions, like the fermenter you will see in this slide. You can see the difference between the fermenters done in a biotech company or a tank done next to your bones. There's obviously a, a large difference in the security that you can have with the with the case strategies that you can go in there. So uh, we are looking at fighting everybody or fighting opportunists, fighting air strategists with probiotic and trying to balance this in a very heavily concentration. And the point here, the little distinctions with the typical bioflux system is that we cannot forget about the autotrophic nutrifiers in this microbiome and concentrate on them to be sure that they are there established so you will not have problems with nitrogen and specifically nitrite. Uh, we are not making a very big use of uh, carbon and we are not using molasses that much, uh, a little bit at the beginning of the crop to, to kickstart the, the, the microbiome, but we are not using it during the crops because we believe that uh, it's more uh, negative than positive as we are feeding those vibrios that will grow faster. Um, the only little trick here, uh, nitrifiers are very slow growers, it's even worse than, than bacillus kind of uh, communities. So there is a need to have a condition in to condition mature waters uh, before uh, the start of the crop. And I can see that in the different experiments shared up to now, that's definitely the, 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 the strategy to, to use. So we will be talking about bioreactors. We are trying to establish all the nitrification processes uh, before stocking. And, and then we can start cultures making an inoculum. Uh, to make it very simple, we are growing shrimp inside a biofilter, if, if, if you want to simplify the the topic. So even from my farmer side, we can understand that when you talked about the microbiome, there is a balance between uh, everything we have in our, our environment. So obviously there is the feed and the shrimp, okay, but we cannot only look at those uh, two uh, parameters. We need to look at it uh, all together. There's the, the live uh, part of it, and you have all the bacterial communities, the, the, the plankton, phytoplankton, etc. And you have what we used to call waste and all the, the organic productions, the feed, the mold, species, and so on. But just consider that the waste are the feed to the life. So everything needs to be looked at together. Uh, if there are zero bacteria and if there are zero waste, the, the production can go very wrong, as many have already mentioned. Now, this being said, so we have nitrification, and at the moment, uh, in, in, in our farms, we are working with okay, heterotrophic populations, mainly bacillus, probiotic, and vibrios, working with autotrophic nitrifiers, uh, which can be simplified to be nitrosomonas and nitrobacter, but we don't really know exactly what they are, because it can change from size to size, and then the management over the, the phytoplankton population. Okay, the phytoplankton population, when you're under a roof in a dark system, there's no phytoplankton. Okay, so we don't have to, to worry too much about, about this part. Uh, the problem of the phytoplankton, it can bring many benefits, as people have been mentioning already, but the problem of phytoplankton, it's a very chaotic uh, evolution, depending on the weather, but also day and night. So that's really something that is basically um, changing or destabilizing our microbiome just because of the weather that cannot be predicted. So that's something to, to look at. Now, this being said, uh, a lot of progress has been done. Uh, scientists working very hard on the microbiome infections, and when it comes to nitrifications, we are discovering there's many more. There's not only uh, autotrophic nitrifiers, but there's you know organisms that have been called like anamox and comamox. There's a lot of things that uh, still remains to be understood. When we talked about competition, we still have the heterotrophic and the autotrophic and the phytoplankton. So that's our main uh, communities that we are trying to, to, to manage uh, in an empirical way in our shrimp ponds. And here also, I think today we need to accept that we don't know much. Uh, there is very 
big tools uh, available from some times when it leads to DNA sequencing. Huge progress is being made. Uh, but now we have also the, the data learning process, the artificial intelligence that will be able to read the, all the, 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 the thousands of millions of data produced by DNA sequencing uh, material. So here too, we have a, a lot of things to discover and I'm sure we are just at the, at the beginning. Uh, so precision farming, of course, today with the time I have, I cannot develop this part that much. I'm gonna make it extremely simple. So just two graphs here, we can all agree that when you stop a pond, the shrimp biomass will increase over time and your feed will increase over time. Um, uh, and this will have an impact on your water quality. And the factual trend is your dissolved oxygen will go down along the crop with the biomass, the pH will go down together with the alkalinity because there are some nitrification processes that consume alkalinity, so this is factual. And we're gonna have like a, a organic matter, I'm of or flock will increase uh, over time during the end of flock. Just the only thing there, so that's very basic and that happened in all the pond across the world. Now, the only difference here is if you are working with the water exchange in the static systems, like the system I'm describing at the moment, you have no filtration systems and you're in a dark system, uh, the evolution of those parameters like pH will be depending only uh, on the shrimp and the feeding on the microbiome you're having, which means that there is no deviations on the evolution of the parameters uh, due to uh, the weather, the rain, or due to a machinery that will be failing or that will be uh, cleaning or changing. I'm thinking about backwash of front filters and, and so on. So in this system, there's really a big use on the data, okay? And, and this data and this stability in the trends of the data makes that we can precisely uh, predict uh, or see what we're gonna have in our ponds, uh, especially how many shrimp do we have? So there's big relations between all those parameters and it's really enhancing the monitoring pressure that we can have on our, on our farms. Just, just a few, quickly, a few examples. This is an application we have been doing in Indonesia. Uh, okay, that was an existing uh, operation. And we start doing uh, a few crops in uh, an old uh, nursery of uh, null hatcheries. So we converted this area uh, to grow out uh, shrimp. We used about 200 to 500 pl per square meter with very satisfactory results, which we have been also trying and introducing those management, those uh, tools into the outdoor farm, still uh, fairly small pond. We're talking about between 1,000 and 1,500 square meter with an orchid mesh on top of it to try to limit the, the impact of the of the light through the through the weather for the for the phytoplankton management. Okay, we have achieved good results, um, predictable results and consistent. But in this farm, I would say that we find basically, I would say when we talk about biosecurity, we find the limits of the biosecurity because there are some sites where the diseases are endemic to the farm. Uh, so more than the biosecurity plan, we are looking at what is effectively applied in a farm right, of this kind. And it's more on the approach of how can we live with the disease. You know, for example, this pond and these crops, we have been challenged with white spot and EMNV together, still can achieve good production. Okay, so that's a very, I think, critical work that we need to, to pursue at the moment. And as a, a big reference, we have a work we are doing for many years in a, in a farm in Vietnam. The, the difference there is that's a new facility. It's a, it's a company that looked at a very large expansion and of production in, in Vietnam. So we are looking on how to reduce the risk and business-wise, how we can make this expansion uh, as less risky as possible to, to hit success. We are using the oral action system with this microbial management with very good results. And so this microbial management with basically the use of the nitrifiers on top of the flop concept uh, makes that at the moment we are expanding on three sites. And I think at the moment we are over 1,000 pounds of, of this kind. So it's becoming a very important tool in their, um, in their expansion. <clears throat> So that's about yeah, at the moment 13 crops we did. Uh, I just put the graph here, the, the, the 200 to 300 PL per square meter. Okay, we tried many different kinds of density to find the optimum. Um, and you have basically the growth curve on the left and the productivity that we are reaching on the right side. Uh, again, what I'm trying to do, what we are trying to do here, it's not to achieve the record of productions. Okay, we are not looking at how many kilo uh, per square meter we can do as a record. 
but it's more to level this in a, in a less risk uh, manner uh, and having a, a consistent output. At the moment, when we are stocking the prop for different bonds, uh, we are achieving a consistency of about 4% between the, between the bonds. And the predictability, which means our targets, how do we, how, how many tons of shrimp we expect to harvest at the moment, we are about 5%. Um, 4% of consistency and 5% of predictability. Uh, myself, in 20, 25 years operating uh, shrimp ponds operation in different locations, I have never seen anything like this. That's definitely a, a huge, uh, huge asset for the systems, and these have tremendous consequences for the challenge that will remain to come if we want to feed the population in a, in a few decades. In terms of pollution cost, roughly we are all going around three kilo per square meter, uh, three euro, uh, three dollars, sorry, per kilo of pollution for uh, about 21 uh, animals. Uh, the repartition of the cost is very similar country to country. Um, just that in this case, the, the, the green one on the right is Indonesia and had access to a slightly cheaper diet there. So that was the, the main difference. But just to say that this production system is economically viable and brings many benefits. The last uh, one, uh, this is the pictures of the intake uh, point of the four different sites we worked in at the moment. So there's Delta waters in the Mekong in Vietnam. In central Vietnam, we are using oceanic waters pretty nice and, and, and clean. In Indonesia, we had two sites, one using coral waters, and on the farm, we have more like a mangrove uh, environment. Um, so this is to say that the results I'm presenting to you that we could get in terms of predictability and consistency has been achieved with four very different water sources. So this makes me believe, and this makes me comfortable that this microbial view uh, on the pollutions can be applied uh, worldwide, okay? Uh, and a little personal uh, milestone for 2020, which was very challenging. Okay, in 2020, like many of us, I didn't move from my uh, office, cannot go on the field, cannot go on the farms. Uh, even though, thanks to the precision of the parameters in the in the farm, and thanks to the microbiome management we are following, we have been for the first year uh, achieved more than 1,000 tons uh, of shrimp productions, uh, not being on the farm. So this is to me um, a good first steps, 1,000 tons. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Manuel. Okay. All right. So that basically wraps up the presentation of the webinar session. So let us now move to the panelist discussion session. Joining us as the Panelists today, we also have Prof. Olaf Weston, a professor in microbial ecology at the NTNU University, and Dr. Peter Describer, the R&D group leader on health and environment in bay aquaculture, both who have been very active on microbial management in aquaculture. Okay, let's start the ball rolling. Uh, so basically, I've compiled quite a number of questions uh, from the registration and also uh, from the chat box. The first, is, it is more on, you know, when it comes to microbial management in aquaculture. So basically everyone is wondering, can this really be done? And would it be stable enough and sustainable enough in future? Can we really stir the microbial diversity to our needs? Probably, Patrick, you can comment on this first. I think we can, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think we have uh, seen a good example today on, uh, on um, research experience, academic experience and uh, uh, field application. Um, I think we are making, we have heard it from the different speakers, uh, there is big progress in understanding what went wrong in the past. I think we have seen very good examples on how uh, things can be improved. Uh, the mature water, the application of simple RAS systems. Um, but, and I think this is a, a, a very positive step uh, for a more sustainable uh, uh, shrimp farming and maybe aquaculture uh, in the future. 
where we are going and uh, maybe that I'm simplifying the things a bit when I say where we are going from a pure monoculture uh, to a more integrated farming. And integrated farming can be at different levels. Uh, the integrated farming can be with different species, as we have seen uh, by different uh, speakers, or can also be by proper microbial management, which I, which I also call a kind of integrated farming. So uh, um, I don't know if this is a good answer for uh, the person who was asking the question. I think we, our knowledge is improving. Applications are definitely uh, on the way forward, but I think we still have a way to go. We have to learn more and see how we can further improve things. But maybe other panel members, I see some hands up. Uh, Olaf uh, might be the first one. Yes, when, when I started working on this microbial management things in the uh, early 1990s, most people had in way something of the same comments. They said that uh, you, you can characterize the microbiota, but you cannot steer them. They are too many and it's too complicated. But now we have been working with this for 30 years and there is not a single experiment we have done where we have been disappointed. And as Kari showed also, the, the, the effect is often dramatic, maybe a factor to increase in survival and things like that. And, and uh, we were working a lot on, um, on uh, turbot rearing uh, in the 1990s. And I remember at one larvae conference in, in Ghent, uh, Schellinger Reitan showed experiment from more nutritional experiment that we have been doing and we had 30 to 40 percent survival during the larval stage at that time and people were very surprised and that and then that was not in a way microbial management experiment but we used the microbial management in more uh, nutritionally related things i there is one warning in this, and I think, like many other things, uh, the microbial management, like the larval rearing, is knowledge based. And if you have uh, some kind of idea about how this should be done, but you don't have uh, a proper insight into how this really works uh, microbiologically, then you can easily run into problems and say that this does not work. But as Kari said, it is easy to operate it, fairly simple, and it's very robust. So I think the answer to the question is, yes, we can do this, but it requires knowledge, both as the platform for making a microbial management strategy, and it requires knowledge from the people that are going to implement it. I can imagine that it is easier to have this microbial microbial management system in hatchery compared to big farms, outdoor ponds. And we do have a question from the audience here in terms of the possibility of applying effective micro, microbial management in big shim farms, such as in Bangladesh. So what do you think? Is it really possible if we have big shim farms and yeah, I, I, in, 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 my, in my opinion, the, the bigger, the more complicated. But it depends also in the degree, degree of reuse of water and water exchange, because if the water exchange is limited. So when I have been talking about this, uh, uh, I have had similar questions before talking to salmon growers and of course, in a in a net pen in the ocean you cannot apply this but i think in a in a shrimp pond um, well my background on shrimp ponds is very very low but i will say as long as you have control over the water exchange and the water exchange is low then it should be possible also in these systems but of course it would be much more easy if you have a covered system, some deal coverage compared to when it's uh, open, because like 
seabirds and other animals can contaminate the systems very quickly if they are allowed free, free access. I, I can see that Kari Emmanuel is also raising their hands. Maybe Kari, you want to comment on something? Yes, I, I want to comment on that uh, question because I think a bigger system is, like Olaf said, maybe more challenged in a way. But uh, if we don't think about it so complicated, microbial management is also stop doing uh, the stupid things. And, and uh, no, if you are doing stupid things, it's, it's not all about doing the correct things. It, so I think at some level you could increase the management just by knowing, having knowledge, and knowing how to not do the stupid things at least. And, and that would probably also increase. And then you could advance from that. And uh, so I think at some level, it will still be possible to do uh, improvements just by knowing what not to do also in big systems. How about you, Manuel? You want to add something? Yes, uh, because the, it, it's actually right. I think uh, just if we could have a better understanding on what we are dealing with, uh, understanding that when we exchange water, it's maybe not necessarily a good thing. Understanding that the feeding is not only feeding the shrimp, but uh, feeding the environment. Uh, having these principles understood and knowing that there's not only shrimp and feed, um, we don't have to go for 100% zero water exchange microbial systems in Bangladesh tomorrow. But just integrating those notions, uh, I think we possibly make a better approach when it comes to how to develop the industry, for example, in Bangladesh. Uh, the new farms to be built, should we build 10 hectare ponds or small ponds? Obviously, if you're having large ponds, the, the, the control you will have on your environment will be lower because you cannot exchange as much water because your, your tools and this, this dynamics is much higher. So, but it doesn't mean that we can just say, okay, forget about it. This is not the right thing to do. I think everybody here, we agree that this is a very nice, robust tool. So how to integrate it, think about it, what can you do about it? It's not one single answer, but there is definitive things to, to, to think of there. Thank you. Okay. So now let's move to the second question. Oh yeah, Peter. Peter wants to say something too. Yeah, I, I want to add to what uh, what Kari, Olaf, and, and Manuel were saying is when you talk about when you think about microbial management, it's all about principles. It's about understanding the ecolo the ecology behind what happens at the microbes. Because I, I see also now a lot of questions popping up like how can we get this bacterium in place and how can we get this bacterium in place? It's not about the names. It's not about which bacteria exactly are there, it's about which groups of bacteria are there and the heterotrophic ones, the autotrophic ones, the fast growers, the slow growers. It's not about specifically a Vibrio harvey or a Cambelli or a Bacillus subtilis or a Bacillus megatherium necessarily. It's about ecological groups and I think this is very important to know. But it still represents, like Kari says, understanding what should be done and what should not be done, not from individual species point of view, but, but about groups of bacteria. Okay, so going back to the understanding the concept of this microbial management. So let's have a look on the process. Actually, when we're looking at, you know, managing this micro, when, what actually we should manage? Is it a type? Uh, yeah, just now Peter mentioned about, you know, understanding the ecology, uh, looking at the groups uh, that are responsible for the activity. Um, is there a specific type? Um, no, actually, in terms of the management, you know, um, does it really depends on the species, number of species, its composition? And then it comes to the second question in terms of application and maintenance. How can we, what, what, what can we apply to beneficial microbes? Should we seed specific microbes every day or once a week? or play with the carbon source addition? Is it good enough? What is actually the best practices? Maybe I should rephrase again. Uh, <laughs> it's more on, you know, understanding you know, how, how can we apply? How, how can one apply and maintain whatever microbes all the 
beneficial microbes that they have already have in their system. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, like, uh, I, I can uh, give a start and then maybe the other ones can jump in. I think it's very important to realize when you talk about microbial management is that it's, it's the environment decides which bacteria can be there and which bacteria cannot be there. So, and that's why I said it's very important to understand the ecology of what they're there. If, like Manuel says, if you have an environment where you add a lot of molasses and there is nitrogen coming from the shrimp, you will have heterotrophic bacteria, you will have a lot of bioflux. If you don't add the molasses, you have a lot of nitrogen, it will be mainly selecting for the autotrophic bacteria, for the nitrifying bacteria. So, how can we do that? How can we select or, or, or um, determine which bacteria are there? It's by changing the environmental conditions. But at the same time, realizing that when you add feed in your ponds, when you add shrimp feed or, or fish feed in your ponds, it also represents nutrients for the bacteria. So we should understand, as it was said before, it's, it's knowledge based. It's, it's understanding what's happening at the level of the microbes and that everything that we do, water exchange, adding feed, removing nitrogen in some way, it all has an effect on the bacteria. When people, for example, they add probiotics and they have been adding probiotics for 20 years already. In the beginning, it was all about, we need to add good bacteria. Now, in my opinion, the most important thing about adding probiotics is that we know that we are not adding harmful bacteria. They have been selected for some features. They have been selected for some positive effects on the animals, which is good. But to get the maximum out of the use of probiotic bacteria, we should un also understand what are the conditions that allows them to survive in the systems. Maybe sometimes people are using practices that they add probiotics, but at the same time, the conditions make that they will go out of the system again within very short notice. So it's kind of wasting money. And that means that, means that by knowing what you do, you can increase the, 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 the efficiency of practices that people have been using for a long time. Okay. I can see Olaf and Kari also raising their hands. Olaf, maybe you want to add? Okay. okay. I, in in uh, some ways, we were lucky because when we started this, it's, it was before we had the techniques where you could run DNA and characterize who were, were there with a fairly good position. We were going into this in a period where there was some kind of a method limitation and as a consequence we need had to look more on the functionality and 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 what type of processes that we wanted and what type of processes we, we don't want to have and may, maybe i, I can, can compare it if you have a leakage in your water supply you ask for a plumber you don't ask for a name you ask for someone who can do the job, whether the name is uh, is uh, Natran or Olav, it doesn't matter as long as the person can do the job. And I think this is where the challenge is now and where we need to develop more knowledge. Like Kari said, we need to know what we want to avoid, what type of processes we want to avoid. And the next thing is we want to know more about what type of processes that we want to have running in the systems, what is critical for the, for the health. And, you know, um, these microbiome things and also microbial management, it has accelerated a lot. And for humans now, they have billions and billions of euros uh, available funding. We have we have nothing compared to this. The, in, in, in human health, they are not able to give any names for what is a good thing. And they have even shown that healthy humans, even healthy twins, have different microbiota, but they are still healthy and good. And I think there was a famous Russian author who said something like, um, like, um, uh, every unhappy family is different, but the happy families, they have all something in common. But I, th I think when it comes to agriculture, maybe it is a bit different. There are not so many ways to get unhappy, but there are very many ways to get happy. 
And I think the, the main thing is not the names, but the main thing is what they do. Okay. Kari? Yeah, I uh, so I su totally support what you have said, of course, before, uh, both Peter and Olaf, but I, if I can try to make it more uh, kind of simple and concrete for you, uh, and I, uh, I would do that, I would try to say that if you should go for something, uh, go for stability and try to keep the organic matter low, but mm -hmm. stable. So it's to make it really simple and boil it down. You don't have to know so much about the microbes, but it's about keep to make a competition uh, that is stable and and make them fight for the food. Uh, that is what if you do that, it's uh, it's hard to do something very wrong. Of course, also you need to have uh, biosecurity coming in. But if you can set up your system to work like that, uh, I think it's very hard to do anything wrong. Also, you can add the probiotics or you can not add probiotics, but still, if you can maintain it like that, uh, I think it at least uh, you have come a, a, a good way. Okay, all right. Okay, understood. Okay, now the next question is on the role of live food, all right, uh, such as algae and zooplankton. For example, microalgae seems to have an effect on the type of bacteria, you know, that are dominating the system. Um, so, is there any, you know, have the speaker, any speakers or a panelist uh, notice any differences when we use different types of algae in the system? For example, you know, differences when we use the green water or the brown water. And I, I even noticed that Robin just now, uh, for example, use mature water with diatom with it. Can can you share your experiences on that when using microalgae? Yes, Olaf. Oh, Olaf, you need to unmute yourself. A little bit. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with different types of algae, but a few different types. And my experience seems to be the main thing is to have some normal non-toxic algae. And then two of them, that is not the most critical. So there, if people have more knowledge, they can probably find some algae species that is better in one situation than the other. Um, but I think in general, they, they, uh, they uh, have a positive e effect on the microbial in environment. Uh, and it really doesn't matter who is there. I, my experience is that um, live algae is better than the, if you add some of this algal paste, uh, which is in the, they, they don't have the same function because they are not alive. So, yeah, Patrick. Yeah. If, if I may add here, um, well, um, indeed, there is, uh, well, there was your PhD, Natra, and uh, there are other studies that um, indicate that there is an, ex an, an interaction between uh, the microalgae and even the macroalgae and uh, the, the, the microbiome. We still need to learn more about. But what I like to uh, mention here is that um, we often see that uh, people do not realize that live food can also be the carrier of uh, Vibrio. And uh, that uh, live food is not produced under the right uh, circumstances. So this is where a couple of the speakers have been uh, referring to. Um, algae, when they are harvested in the exponential phase, fine. But many, many farmers, they want to have the maximum out of their algae culture and they are waiting until just the end of the exponential phase. But that's a moment where you have already mortality in your algae and that means substrate for bacteria. That means dissolved organic matter for vibrio development. So there are two sides on the coin. We need to learn more about what 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 is the impact of um, macro and microalgae on the microbiome and then second 
microbiology and live food should be produced under biosecure conditions. I cannot underline it enough because, for example, people switching from indoor to outdoor production of uh, algae. In a number of cases, I remember that uh, bioluminescence could be um, correlated with the place where uh, the uh, microbiology were produced. Okay, All right. So we need more study on that. All right, so next is on the new disease, which are, you know, basically found that many of them are caused by microbes and we are booming in aquaculture recently. There is also uh, literature on the occurrence of antibiotic resistance uh, in probiotic. So is there a possibility that microbes, including mature microbiota, can somehow backlash and became a pathogen? Maybe I can comment a little bit on that. Yeah, uh, I think when you use the microbial ecology to control, it means that you are changing, like Peter said, the conditions and you are uh, welcoming all the different species and you are making them compete. So it's, I think, the opposite of what you are doing with antibiotics when you are killing uh, everything and you are uh, making less competition. Uh, and also where you make it very favorable to be the one that can uh, fight it. So uh, I think it's not very dangerous when it comes to the microbial uh, uh, conditions that we are going into resistance because we are, are working on the uh, ecology more. Uh, and also the goal must be, I think, to use less antibiotics and uh, Olav have done some work uh, earlier that shows that using microbial matured systems is actually the same uh, good effects as using antibiotics in some cases. So you can exchange that for uh, using uh, uh, microbial matured and probably more safe than uh, antibiotics. Okay. Olav, you want to add? Just as a small comment on uh, the uh, development of antibiotic resistance, <clears throat> as Kairi said, the, the rule number one should be to have a practice where you can avoid it. And uh, there is a very good example in, in Norwegian salmon farming. Uh, they hardly use, they only use a few grams or a, a per year. Um, then, of course, uh, antibiotic resistance, it can travel horizontally, so it can be, it can be exchange, genetically exchangeable uh, elements, but, but to keep this element, it has some costs. And I think in a situation where you do, as Kairi said, to make sure that there is always strong competition for the organic matter available there, then to maintain this uh, antibiotic resistance genes, they will probably be, uh, they have some cost, and as a consequence, they will, these microbes will probably be less competitive in, on their uh, situation with very strong uh, competition. So I think it's something you should be aware of, but I don't think the risk is very big. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, uh, there is more on the general question. I also received some technical questions from the attendees. First is on the possible use of bacterial phage therapy in microbial ma management system. Any possible use using bacterial phage therapy? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, um, I don't. But the use of bacteriophages, it's, it's something relatively novel. Um, and uh, for the people who don't know about bacteriophages, bacteriophages is viruses that infect bacteria. And, and this is a kind of thing which is coming up also within the aquaculture industry. And in that sense, I would say that the use of phages, it is a kind of microbial management strategy. It's not something that can be achieved by having uh, changing parameters and so on. Um, of course, if you change the conditions, uh, some number of bacteria will increase in numbers and you will have more phages because the phages are linked to the bacteria. 
but in the context that we are talking about changing um, uh, changing how much water is replaced how much nutrients are added and so on it will not have a direct influence as i would see it on phage numbers in the sense that we would use them as a microbial management strategy okay all right and then another technical question in of using oxidation methods for reducing nitrate in pond. Is it good? Probably manual have a explanation for this oxidation method for reducing nitrate in ponds. What is the extent of using oxidation method for reducing nitrate in ponds? So, sorry, uh, you're talking about reducing nitrite. No. Nitrite, yes, sorry, nitrite. Well, in my uh, experience in the farm, the only thing that has been working in reducing nitrites in my conditions are nitrifiers. Mm, okay. So, uh, and this was very robust. And if I look at the different presentation, it seems that when we talked about case strategist, we talked about biofilters. So I understand that when we don't work together, they are still working in the similar communities about the nitrification bacteria. No, so sure. their, their power of digesting nitrite is very high and, and, and if I want to read a little bit the nitrogen cycling that we have in our shrimp ponds, I will tend to think that actually when you start a pond, there's nothing you can do about the development of nitrifiers. They will become part of the communities. And you know that there's two communities. There's uh, ammonia oxidizers, nitrite oxidizers, and the ammonia oxidizers are fairly uh, quick to established in the systems, you know. Uh, and, and I do believe that when you start a shrimp pond using carbon or not, you will still have ammonia oxidizing bacteria that will go into your pond. And I really do believe that this is this uh, ammonia oxidizing bacteria that are producing the nitrite that accumulate. So this to me have nothing to say with the use of carbon or heterotrophic. So, and it's something, it's very unavoidable. And I, I don't have a huge experience in RS systems, but I will tend to believe that if the biofilter of the RS system is not well dimensioned, you will have the same nitrite spikes problems. So the conditioning nitrification bacteria uh, means that you have these spikes of ammonia and nitrite with no shrimp. And you're conditioning this, like this biofilter, it's all running, all mature, and using this because I've seen that even if you're doing a little inoculum of 1% or 2%, depends on, on this digestion rates that you're achieving in your bio, biofilter, like carrying capacity. But if you do that, this nitrofarious can never establish well in a bone all the time. And to me, this has been the only way for me to fix nitrite problems. I have never found any other tools being able to be so efficient. Okay, uh, I see Robbins is also raising his hand. Well, we'll see. Uh, for me, if there's nitrite problem, you, you've got a, a reduced area to pond someplace. Uh, generally, when we go through the nitrogen cycle, everything should go to nit nitrate. But oftentimes, it'll go up, and then the nitrate will even out, and you'll actually start seeing some increases of nitrite. That's because this pond is no longer oxidized. There is a reduced area, there's sludge on the bottom. There is a problem area in the pond. If your pond is perfectly clean on the bottom, you have no reduced areas, your nitrate will continue to go up and you won't accumulate nitrite. But nitrite almost always in my experience is associated with a bad bottom or a reduced area in the culture system. Okay. Harry, you want that? Yeah, from the RAS perspective, we know that, for example, if the question was about adding um, adding oxidants, it, it may actually be an option to add uh, ozone or, or hydrogenic peroxide or something like that. Uh, the problem is because, in theory, that can oxidize the nitrate, so it could be like a help. Your problem is that when you have the nitrate problem, like you said uh, before, Robins, uh, there will be a lot of other problems with the water quality, which will eat up the, uh, the oxidizing uh, compound. So you will have to add so much to, so, so it's not going to be a practical solution at all. But in theory, you could add an oxidizer to help you to get these nitrate uh, peaks down, but in reality, it will not help because there will be so much uh, consuming that oxidizer. So, so uh, it, it's better to look at the microbes and look at uh, uh, how they are, how their conditions are, 
to help you to get rid of it instead of uh, thinking to add something. Okay. Just to go to add something here, and again, just sharing my experience there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're conditioning nitrifiers, everybody that works with a biofilter knows that it can take a long time to have nitrite oxidizing bacteria in your biofilter. And what happens in the ponds I have been monitoring is I do believe that when you're making water exchanges, try to control your nitrite, you're basically washing up the nitrite oxidizing bacteria and try to establish. So everyone has his own experience, but in my experience, I have nitrite accumulation in ponds that have zero organic matter accumulation or zero leaks. And this was linked to this establishment of nitrifier. So I support different conditions and experience. Uh, so yeah, there's one to add this for me. Mm, okay. Olaf, I also see you raise your hand. And Peter, you have anything to add? At least we see that in some cases where there is accumulation of uh, nitrite, it is mm -hmm. because we have unmature uh, nitrifying biofilters. Because in some cases, the nitrite oxidizers take a longer time to develop. And uh, so, uh, at least uh, in some situations, especially where we have had some changes in the environmental conditions, like changes in, in uh, salinity or things like that, then this is very often related to an unbalance. This is just to add on something extra compared to to what the robin mentioned okay all right so robin you do mention about the need to really uh, remove the sludge so we do have questions from the audience how do you actually eliminate sludge collected from the culture tank and do you reuse it as a fertilizer or anything if we're talking about culture tanks i assume we're talking about pond shrimp and, and that's where the toilet has become a very effective tool in accumulating the sludge around the center, at which point it can be pumped up and out into a collection area, or it can be pumped down and out to a collection area. Uh, and depending on the buildup, you can be removing it every five minutes, every two minutes, or once a day. So as the culture matures, you get more and more food input, more and more sludge accumulation, uh, you basically set the timer on your toilet to flush more often uh, because really if you want to improve growth you keep the bottom clean you keep the system oxidized and you will get the best growth but if you have accumulation outside of disease if you have accumulation on the bottom of sludge and a reduced air shrimp do not grow that well okay we have questions here on because we have here stream specialists just now talking on bio system in the outdoor system and in the outdoor and also indoor system. Um, any advantages or disadvantages, uh, you know, between this system? Which is better? Oh, yeah, I, I can see both are good actually. <laughs> But maybe, uh, uh, you know, manual or we can hear also from Pam if we have any challenges or difficulties in maintaining this system. The biofloor yes. and also a uh, rust system. Okay, uh, thank you for the outdoor pond. I think uh, we need to balance the condition and equality ecological system that I show you that we use a lot of uh, several species and do integrate system. So the challenging is uh, it's quite difficult to control the, the weather and the others. So the farmers have the quite of uh, like a sophisticated technique has the experience and also more, more offer uh, to reduce load of organic matter also to uh, have the waste management is the key success for the, the outdoor stream farming in the reservation system. Thank you. I can see Robin is also raising his hand. Yeah, I think I just comment is basically on, on flock, it's autotrophic or heterotrophic. And for me, 
I started with heterotrophic flock, and everybody is still on heterotrophic flock. Uh, heterotrophic flock is dirty. It gets diseased. It's reduced. It's not the best flock. Autotrophic flock is the way to go. It's a light flock. Most people will look at an autotrophic flock pond and go, there's no flock. Actually, it's a very efficient flock that basically is dirty the pond and allows the pond to stay oxidized. And so you're going to get your best growth and fewer programs. But heterotrophic flock too often times goes bad and actually reduces the growth rates. Okay. All right. Okay, since we really... Uh running out of time, I can just take one more question. Okay, do you think microbial communities both in water and host could affect the host quality in terms of taste and texture? Basically, uh, the people, um, Dr. Uh, this is from Dr. Madeline, Dr. Madelina, okay. So they have basically tested different production system and they saw differences not only in productivity but also the shrimp metabolites, profiling and sensory evolution. So have you have you had any experience in terms of you know whether the microbes in the water could affect taste and also texture of the shrimp? Mm, uh, for uh, for me, I think uh, that uh, maybe it can uh, indirect effect, like uh, it can do like a predigest to the feed that a shrimp uh, eating, and this can release some uh, nutrients that are more effectively to shrimp to uh, digest and uh, use it, and for the metabolites. I think. All right, Peter, you raise your hand. Yeah, uh, because I think it's an interesting question. I have no experience with it myself, but I can imagine that there might be some influences there. If you if you look at some species of bacteria or microorganisms which are responsible for off flavor and so on in fish, I can imagine that there might be some possibilities uh, that it also has an effect that changes substantial, huge changes in microbial communities have uh, an effect on taste, but. To my, to my knowledge, I don't know of any uh, any specific cases where the differences would be so so big that it results in shrimp not being accepted by the consumers. All right. Okay. Patrick, you want to comment? I think Robbins is before me. Oh yeah, Robbins. Oh, I didn't even know I was supposed to comment. Uh, I, I will say off flavor is a big problem in shrimp. So there are certain conditions where you get a blue green algae or you get a fungus or you get certain bacteria that give off flavor and those shrimp are totally unmarketable. And so if we're looking at that as, as microbial, yes, uh, microbes can influence the economics of a shrimp farm in terms of the quality of the shrimp being produced. It was the same comment I wanted to make. So. Okay, all right. I think we really uh, running off out of time now, so I think we have a webinar. That I would like to personally thank all the speakers for the very insightful discussion, and all attendees for for the participation. Participation. Uh, but before we end the session, I just want to share with all of you on the next uh, was uh, meeting. which will be in Singapore in December 5th and 8th this year. Uh, so all are invited, okay? And um, just before we leave, can I ask uh, all the panelists to stay uh, behind just to have a group picture? And thank you, thank you from me. Thank you everyone for the nice talk. <laughs> we actually have a lot of questions, but it's really hard to address all of them. Thank you, you did a great job. It was nice. <laughs> okay, Nate, are we ready?
Okay. One, two, three. All right. Okay. All right. So I'll see you again in the next <laughs> webinar, perhaps. Thanks. Thanks for uh, giving a nice talk presentation. It's really late here in Malaysia. <laughs> for, uh, you know, to break my fast. <laughs> I'll see you again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.